The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pants Studios. You know I'm RyanSickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. I want to say thank you like I do every week. Thank you for supporting this show. Thank you for all you do here, whether you've been here or whether you're new here. And whether and if you got to have more, listen to me. I say this every week, Patreon. The Patreon is the way to go. You got all these... We're sitting here talking about it with our guests now. All these, uh, you know, flags and red marks and censored words and everything, not on Patreon. And the Patreon is called The Honeydew with Y'all. And it's the wildest show on Patreon. It's your stories. And I promise you, you've never heard anything like it. All right. And if you're looking for a new podcast to listen to, my old podcast, The Crab Feast, which our guest today also has an episode. Look, that has been gone for five years, and the library did 1.1 million downloads this year. It's insane. So thank you for that. And I'm telling you, it's all your same favorite guest in podcasting with different stories you haven't heard before. It's called The Crab Feast. I did it with Jay Larson. Go check it out. All right. Make sure you're subscribed to my new podcast, The Way Back. It's right here on this YouTube channel. Um, It's a fun new podcast we just started. And um, looking forward to you guys enjoying that one as well. All right. Um, For all dates, all that stuff, ryansickler.com. That's the biz. You know what we're doing over here. We're highlighting the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers. And I am very excited to have this guest on today. First time here on the Honeydew. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dan Cummins. Welcome to the Honeydew, Dan Cummins. (laughs) Thank you, Ryan. Long overdue, bro. Good to see you again, man. Same. And congrats on all your success. I love it. Thank you, and same to you, bro. Ryan's a Ryan's a, a good dude. The be, one of the best reputations just in the business, as far as just being a, a solid guy. Is that right? Yes. That's in what addition to being, say yes. Out there, I don't no know. one has a bad word. Truly, <laughs> no, that's not true. I, no one that I've talked to. <laughs> Seriously. All right. All right, all right. <laughs> um, look, before we get into whatever we're going to talk about today, please plug, promote everything, anything. Dan Cummins. Yeah, just a uh, time suck podcast. If you like deep dives on conspiracies, uh, serial killers, interesting historical figures, and more. More. And uh, scared to death if you like paranormal kind of campfire ghost stories. Uh, I do that with my wife, try and scare her every week. And then uh, I got a special trying to get better on YouTube. All right. That's it. So I was saying, like, I know you. We, you did the Crab Feast, great yeah. episode back in the day. And Time Suck was taken off at the time and it, you really popped. Yeah. And I was yeah, like, yeah, this motherfucker's doing good. Good for him, man. Yeah. I love seeing people like, st- like, look at Matt Reif. You got oh a new uh, TikTok, yeah. and then boom, yeah. he takes off. Yep. I love seeing people figure out something yeah. and then run with it. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. well, like we're all here for some people take stand up and parlay it for a, a morning DJ, yeah. drive time. Yeah. Some get a talk show, some get a this, a that, a this. I love seeing what uh, comedians are able to do. Me too. I man. think we're some of the smartest, <laughs> hardest working hustlers and creative when it comes to. What has to be out there? There's actors yeah. didn't do these podcasts. It, it is comics. So, Joe yeah, comics really got to do it first. All yeah, in Segura comics did all this. Yeah, all this. And, it, and, it, and it's fun to uh, to see how things are morphing and changing. Where it's like, you know, when we started, it was just very traditional. You know, my it's apartment like, started in my crab feast was in my apartment or at I mean, the kitchen stand table. Up. Oh yeah, yeah. Like yeah. we started sitting there. What there weren't all these options. It was just like there was gatekeepers. There was you do this open mic. You hope that you can get to MC. Yeah. You hope that you can feature. Uh, you hope that Comedy Central or one of the late night people take a liking to you and you know uh, give you airtime so you can so you can get on the morning radio in Peoria or Wichita because you were on the Tonight Show or whatever. I mean, it was like this very linear. This is how Regimented, you do it. Regimented. Mm-hmm. This is way it goes. And then all I was just talking to these twenty-year-old kid in Arizona. We're not going to be talking about this, everybody, the whole time. But this twenty-year-old <laughs> kid in Arizona, Phoenix. I yeah. let him open for me. Yeah. Um. I let him do a guest spot, and I was like, "Dude, you're fucking really good. You're strong. You're funny. You're twenty. Yeah. You actually have My shit God. to talk about. Yeah. And um, he's like, "What advice do you have?" And I was like. Let me tell you what advice I have. <laughs> when we started, yeah. we had to bring a goddamn VHS camera, right. okay, record yep. our shit, yep. then go to a dub house and yep. get a bunch of them made, pack them up, mail them 
Hope that fucking made it. Hope yeah. that somebody over there had a VCR that they put it <laughs> right. in and watch. Like, are you kidding? Come on, Yoder. Tonight, you can take your yeah. phone, pop it up on a set. It can look shitty. Yeah. And you can go out tomorrow. You can go home tonight, upload yeah. it, and yeah. go viral tomorrow. Yep. Tomorrow. It's so different. It's beyond different. And then you're in the driver's seat. You know, like yours. when you go viral now, it's like you have the power to, to draw. You yeah. can make deals with clubs. And it's like so many more people. You don't even have to work the clubs. You can just pick any venue that you, that you can make a deal with that your fans will come to. You can skip the whole comedy club industry and just do stand up outside yeah, of the, it. The it's fans just, come I love it because they love you yep. or whoever. Mm-hmm. It's not the building. There are very few yeah. buildings. Comedy right. works, comedy store, yeah. the mothership. There are very few buildings that people right. are like, let's go because that place. No. Mm-hmm. All right, Dan Cummins, let's get into you. Bro. <laughs> I want because I, I really don't know your whole story. I really yeah. don't know where you're from originally, your your background. You'd mentioned you had a little bit of a different upbringing. So let's yeah, talk about a little, it. A little atypical. I, uh, I was born in uh, Grangeville, Idaho little town i didn't live there but but only born there because my town didn't have a hospital so i was born in riggins idaho is that right yep and riggins is about 400 people now little logging used to be a logging town now it's 400 people what the hell was it when you were born it was it was a little more it's it's kind of dying okay but not much more it was like 500 wow (laughs) it was like it was a a high school class oh yeah my high school i graduated with 23 kids (laughs) yeah (laughs) yep 23. That's one classroom when I was in high school. Oh, yeah. Easy. There yeah. had to be more than 23 in <laughs> yeah, some of our 30, classes. Yeah, 30, typical 35. No yeah. shit. Okay, so yeah. you had to go to another town to get born. Yep, you either, if you were, if you grew up in Riggins, uh, if you weren't born at home or in the car on the way to the hospital somewhere, which was what my happened to my aunt, you, you were born in Grangeville or McCall. They're like both about an hour away in either direction along this little canyon highway. It's just like a, it's a, it's a very... Like the town can't get big. There's no room for it. It's in a very steep, just river canyon in the middle of Idaho. Yeah. So it's not only small, but it's not like, it's not like small Midwest where yes. Okay. You have 400 people, but if you just drive 15 minutes, there's a town of 6,000 and then 10 minutes away is a town of 20,000. Like a, like one of those peripheral small towns. It's a small town, not near anything. You have to drive a long way to get to other tiny towns. Like it's super remote. And because of the, because it was so remote, you know, like cable TV, all those kind of things, it was not a priority because there was not enough in financial incentive for those things to exist there. So we were like 10, 15 years behind technology wise. Is that right? Oh yeah. Like, like way you, behind. You're how old now? I'm 46. So when did you guys get cable out there? Like, not when I lived there. <laughs> Are yeah. you serious? You Didn't still exist. have it? Didn't exist. Yeah. No shit. We, we had the, the thing that you could get was in a, an illegal satellite TV configuration, which mm-hmm. uh, there wasn't like Dish or those places. But what people would do, and it cracks me up looking back that I guess just no one cared about regulating this. You would get a massive, if your family had the money, you get a massive satellite dish, like like a NASA type dish. Giant thing on a huge, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot concrete slab. And then you would get this thing called the black box descrambler and it would give you all of the channels. And I don't know how it was configured, but it, so you either had no channels or all of the channels. But if you didn't have one of those, then you had to depend on the airwaves. And my grandpa was actually one of the ones that put this reflector up on this mountaintop on the uh, edge of town because it's so down in this canyon that the airwaves wouldn't reach it. So they like hiked up, like dragged this thing uh-huh. up. Yeah. Like your grandfather was, was responsible for TV yeah. in that town. And you, then you get like three channels. <laughs> That's great. They, or three or four. Three, you I'll take it over <laughs> right, none. Right. Yeah. Hell yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. really, <laughs> very different. So very limited, like you're separated from the rest of the world and you can't even connect with them tech wise. And are you um, an only child? No, I have a uh, sister. Older so or me, younger? Younger. Okay. Yeah. And Donna's, what about- Five and a half years younger. Okay. What about your parents? Were they together? No. Uh, together so, when I was born. Okay. And then when I was, I don't know, two or three, my dad moved to Anchorage, Alaska. He was a logger. Oh, shit. Okay. And then he went up there to work with his brothers in construction. A couple of his brothers had moved there. And then my mom and him followed him. So when I was like three or so like that, we went to Alaska as well. And so then I went to kindergarten, first, second, half a third grade in Anchorage. My sister was born when I was like in kindergarten. Then my parents split up. Dad stayed in Anchorage. And then we went back to Riggins to live with my grandparents. 
Okay, so let me ask yeah. you this question because this is interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Anchorage is not the biggest city in the world either, but no. it, but is it an is it an upgrade in tech and everything compared to where you just left in Idaho? Oh yeah, I mean I you know it's like I was pretty little then, but I have memories of like you know you're not supposed to watch HBO, you know like like that kind of stuff. Like we actually had we had it, yeah 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 yeah. 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 Uh, and, and I remember, like, you know, we had a It's just a wild mall. to me to think that Alaska, is the, you think this yeah. frozen tundra is, is dialed in more than oh, that yeah. little town. I remember we had Fred Myers. Uh, we had Taco Time, like, mm -hmm. around us. You yeah. know, like, and then we went back to Riggins and just nothing. Like, there's no fast food there. Really? Nope. There's no chains. So still? Uh, still, yeah, for a little while. Um, after you put I left. a Papa John's in that motherfucker, you're gonna be rich, bro. <laughs> yeah. You just should franchise a Papa John's in there tomorrow. What's well, a weird thing too? Like nobody supports. It's a weird local mentality too. It's like no one shops local, even though it's like this tiny little town. What people will do is they'll they'll go to Costco. They'll go two and a half hours away. Is it that far? Yeah, it's, it's like this Lewiston, Idaho, or two hours. Look between depends on how you drive. Two two and a half. Go to Lewiston, Idaho. Lewiston, Clarkston. Go to the Costco. Everybody has like a deep freeze. Like my mom does this and then just stocks up for like a month or two's worth of food. And then when one of the local businesses dies again, they're like, oh man, I just town's dying. I'm like, yeah, because none of you shop at the local places. Right. It's like, I can't believe anything still exists there. Outside so your of parents houses. are still there? Uh, my mom, <laughs> yeah, this is so you're, this is ridiculous, but my stepdad, so my mom gets married again when I'm like, I don't know, a 10 or 11 mm -hmm. to this guy, Tim, my stepdad still, Tim Hinckley. Well, Tim had lived in Whitebird, which is even smaller than Riggins. It's like a hundred people, uh, 30 miles away. He moves to Riggins <laughs> and then he convinces my mom, uh, when I was like at the end of high school to move back to Whitebird because Riggins seriously is too many people for him. <laughs> Oh, yeah, <laughs> he didn't like all the neighbors. He didn't like it's just neighbors. too much. Neighbors, <laughs> there's just 400 people. Yep. This motherfucker yep. called them neighbors. So he, that's so, a parade. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so now they're in Whitebird, <laughs> and not even in Whitebird. They're like just outside of Whitebird. So you all really by gotta want to be. First of all, you better love the shit out of your partner. If that's oh, all, yeah. if that's all, you'd be around all you're, the time, all the time, yep. right? Yep, and. <laughs> you really got to want to love to live out there like that, huh? Yeah, you got to love the outdoors. Yeah, and, and be quiet. isolated. There, is there, mm -hmm. Are you playing sports or anything like that? Is there any organized sport? What, like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> there was sports, but not a lot of them. We didn't have baseball. Um, for like you briefly. didn't have fields or just not nah, enough people to coach? We had play, a field, sort of thing. but not enough people. And, and also it's like, it's small, but you have to drive so far to get to other communities. It's like, you got to go to a, a half an hour to another town called New Meadows is about the same size as us. And then another half hour. Past. So there's like, and it's kind of like a dangerous, like these little like highway Canyon roads. And so it was tricky to, um, to get to other places. Our school didn't have baseball, but we did have like American Legion ball for like two years. And mm -hmm. then, but then that went away. It wasn't enough people. Uh, we had basketball, track, um, volleyball all through the soccer, school. Football. No soccer. Um, and so we had eight man football. Eight man. Yeah. And yeah. everybody played offense and defense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was crazy. We had a first round draft pick well after my time there. What do you mean? Le Leighton Vander Esch for the Dallas Cowboys played in Riggins. Nah. Yep. How he, the hell did they find him? Kudos to the scouts oh, on that guy. He went from Salmon River High, where I went to high school. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to tell you about our mascot. It's so inappropriate. And then went to, walked on to Boise State, okay. if I remember That's right. the blue, uh, mm -hmm. blue, the blue turf. turf, right? Yeah. And then played so well there that he got attention. No shit. But yeah, he came out of, I mean, I don't know him or anything. Yeah. It was after my time, but like, yeah, came out of little old Riggins. No shit. All Salmon right. Salmon River Savages. Savages is oh, what yeah. you guys were. Uh, are painted on the gym yeah, what's wall. The, yeah. uh, American Indian guy, wild eyed on horseback with a tomahawk yeah. race. Like he's about to murder people. The savage. To this day, it's still that. Is it? Yeah, ain't nobody and, telling them to change And that not shit. the most inappropriate mascot in our league. <laughs> Who's the most inappropriate? Uh, or, or maybe they're just, maybe they're out of our league, but we would play them once or twice. But Orfino, Idaho, which is a little bigger, <laughs> their mascot is the maniac. I believe still it was growing up, and I last I checked, it still was Orfino Maniacs. Yeah, and who what represents and, the maniac? Uh, uh, a crazy eyed hair going everywhere, and I, I believe I think they changed the painting maybe to act like it wasn't what they were doing. But when I grew up, 
it was uh, like a dude in a straight jacket. It was like a maniac. And next to the high school was this, one of the state mental hospitals. Nah. -uh. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, the high school, the maniacs. And <laughs> the they, mascot, just get him to come home. <laughs> yeah. Get a new mascot every night. Yeah. And they tried to say when they got, they got you know, people later got mad about it. And they're like, no, 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 it has nothing to do with the state hospital. Uh, they acted like it was just some announcer said, oh, they're playing so hard on the court. They're playing like a bunch of maniacs. And that's all it was. It's like, no, I, I saw the painting. It's clearly a nod. That is Joe over there. Yeah, that's, yeah, that that's Joe. That is Joe. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, tiny, so tiny little sports sports teams. But we did have we, we did have sports. But but other than that, I mean, what would you do? A lot of kind of like dinking around in the woods. Do you have four wheelers? What do you have out there? Not when I was growing up, but my mom does now. Four wheelers. It was mostly like, God, you, I mean, just walking uh, then. Yeah, just bike riding, playing hoops at the yeah. you know little outdoor court in town, or just um, uh, swimming in the river, like uh, outdoor stuff. I mean. Some people, it's, it was normal back then to like, you know, just walk out in the woods with a, I don't know, 22 rifle and shoot at squirrels, yeah. like real backwood stuff. Yeah. Yeah. My, like my, my stepdad, like I have so many memories of weekends, him and his buddies, it was very typical They at the time, they would just like, we'd go camp on the weekends. So we're already living in a small town and then we'd leave the small town, go way further out in the woods, camp. And it was basically just a bunch of dudes drinking Keystone Lights and shooting at small creatures like they would spend an entire afternoon <laughs> just shooting doing at, that shooting at groundhogs and if you're like if you ask them like well why why are you doing that why not it's what just something to, to do. do yeah yep yep so how often are you seeing your dad then when your mom you said your mm -hmm. mom followed him up but then left right so w so what age do you stop seeing your dad regularly at least uh, so I, I was third grade so mm. i think i was eight okay uh eight or nine but i think eight and then I don't, and then for a few years, I, I just don't see him much. He, he's, he's up in Alaska. We're down there. I saw him maybe like once or twice a year, weekend or something like that. Talked to him on the phone, usually once a week. And then he moves down to Arizona. And then I, I don't know, seventh or eighth grade is when I first spent like a summer or half the summer with him. So then I'd spend half the summer with my dad. And then he moved to Las Vegas and when I was a freshman in high school, so the summer before freshman year in high school, I went down to spend part of the summer with my dad and then just didn't come back. I, I like I was kind of a dad's dad's boy and uh, wanted to spend more time with him. So then I went to live in Las Vegas my freshman and sophomore year of high school. And so then went to a, a high school where there was like 650 kids in my class. And it was yeah, just like what's huge that? culture Let's shock. Talk about that. Yeah, you went uh, to Vegas? Went to Vegas. Why we Vegas? That's where my dad was living for construction. So you just, and so you want to be with him. Be with, wanted to be with him. And that's where he was living. And so uh, my sister, now my, my sister and I kind of split. So she's living with my mom primarily. I live with my dad primarily. And it was, we were living in this Anchor Village apartments off of like Rainbow and uh, uh, Durango. It's been so many years. And I went to uh, Bonanza High School. What and, was their mascot? Uh, What's I don't mascot? remember actually. I don't even know what their mascot <laughs> is. Cowboy or I know, some probably shit. a cowboy yeah. or something. But it was that was like my introduction. Like we had kids at the school who suppo supposedly were like in gangs, like the Bloods and stuff. And I would see yeah, like crazy talk about fights. that, dude. You're going from a oh. hundred kids to, or your graduating class was twenty three. Yep. You said to this, yeah. And our our high school there had about I don't know 20, 24, 25, 2600 kids, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And it was huge culture shock because I was like very much, and we were poor too. Like both dad and mom, very poor. So I'm like getting my clothes at like flea markets and stuff. But that was the first time I knew I was poor because in Riggins, everybody mm, was poor. Tell me about that. Yeah. So it's like, and then all of a sudden in my freshman year of high school, uh, you know, I, I distinctly felt like for the first time, like a, a massive outsider. It's like, you know, I got these these kids with their Z Cavaricis yeah. and all that kind of stuff or Hugo Boss or whatever. And I'm like wearing like a Bart Simpson fucking flea market T-shirt. Yeah. And, uh, and, and like, because we live next to this kind of rich area. It was like our apartment complex. But then next to this area called the Lakes where it's like an artificial lakes and these mansions. And those kids went to my same school. But then also kids from like rougher areas went. So it was like the first time I'd been around like cliques. And I didn't really fit in any of them. And I I'm also to, guessing everyone in your town in Idaho was yeah. white. Yep. Anchorage, uh, maybe not like so much. like one kid, maybe. Anchorage, not so much. Yeah. But in Idaho, it's like, <laughs> like you would have maybe one family. Like um, we had one 
literally one Asian girl in town, in the whole town, in my class, Jenny Beto. Her dad was Japanese. Her mom was white. She lived with her white mom in Riggins. So it was like literally just Jenny. And then uh, what was it? Uh, Garcia's family. It was like we had one family, Joey. I remember his first name, who was Hispanic, like literally one Hispanic family. And that was it, I feel like, as far as ethnic diversity. And then, you know, Las Vegas, it was, you know, I'm everything. Saying, everything. Latino, yep. Asian, white, black, everybody's yep. out there. Yeah. 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 And I, I uh, so yeah, so I went from like being a kind of a popular kid, I guess, in Riggins, as far as everyone's kind of popular there for the most part. But uh, one of the more popular, I was kind of like a little jock, played basketball, uh, baseball, you know, when it was going, anything I could. And then in, and it was good for there, for like for Riggins. Go to Vegas and I am beyond like not even going to like ride the bench, like not a whiff of playing on any of the teams. Not that's what I wanted to say about yeah. the guy that got drafted. Oh, it's crazy the leap he made. That's what I'm saying. Like yeah. you think in 100 people, like yeah. even the top guy and then you put him. Yep. It's, it's like the Heisman Trophy winner in college. You put him in the NFL. Yep. Sometimes they don't even do shit. Yep. Best college guy can't even be anything in the NFL. Right. It happens. So for you, for that guy to oh, go from there and be like, well, yeah, it is insane. That's to not insane. be intimidated. Right. And, ju and just speaks to his like raw athletic ability. Yes. I did not have that. Blessed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. totally. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and then I just became kind of a delinquent. Yeah, so oh, Las really? Vegas. I was going to say, how'd you fit in? So you become not well. a delinquent. So I, so I don't really have any friends. Uh, and then I, and then looking back, kind of like analyzing myself, I don't know that I would have thought this at the time. But like I went there to spend time with my dad. My dad was busy with construction and just like with my stepmom and, and just not like a real interactive dad at that time. And so looking back, I think I was pretty pissed about it. And so I'm just kind of stewing in my room. And then, you know, like uh, I meet this kid named Chris and he's just like anarchy. Uh, he lives in the apartment. Actually, it was condos, this complex of condos next to our apartment complex situation and his mom, single mom, no dad around, and his mom is usually at her boyfriend's house every weekend. So if I would stay the night at Chris's on the weekend, we had free reign to do whatever we yeah. wanted. And whatever we wanted uh, tended to revolve around trying to make explosives and <laughs> <laughs> and burning a lot of shit. Yeah, burning shit. So we were like starting <laughs> fires. We were breaking. He had a lock pick set. We were breaking into places, breaking into cars. For real? Oh, yeah. Trying to blow shit up. No, I was the only, I, it was Chris, me, uh, Russ, and I can't remember this fourth kid, but like out of all of us, they all had records and I like barely avoided getting caught every You're time into somebody else. places. What kind of places? Like businesses Cra and shit? Craziest place we broke into that I could have gotten a lot of trouble. We had these fucking, all these convoluted plans. We played basketball at this either grade school or junior high, like half mile down the road. And we came up with this plan. We were going to break into that, into the school. The school. Mm -hmm. Take computers. Christ. And then pawn the computers for money for video games. Just some fucking dumb 15, 16 year old plan. And so one night we're, we're staying at Chris's place. We had a, Russ was supposed to be our getaway driver. <laughs> and uh, he drops us off. We push this dumpster over the edge of the building, climb up the building. There's an access thing on the roof. We're able to like break that, get in. And then we're able to like break door locks. It was like the, the handles that you grab that are the horizontal to the floor. And if you just stood on it basically and pushed all your weight you could kick it and break it and get mm -hmm. into these places and then we walk out i don't know alarms are going off we walk out they're like, going off for real mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're walking and we walk walking. out like with computers uh, with computers in our arms but you know it's middle of the night kind of a quiet residential we still thought we could get out of there. well then some security guard has you know been alerted and is coming to our place and you know, gets out of the car, but he's like, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 feet away, put the computers down, yelling at us, you know, walk over here. And I tell Chris, it's like, like that time in Vegas where we were at, there would be like a block of developed, you know, track houses, apartments, whatever. And then next to it, a full block of just desert. So totally dark. So there was like this grid of, you could just kind of like weave through these darker areas and be a little sneaky. And I was like, no, man, let's just go. Well, Chris thought he could talk his way out of it. He sets his stuff down, walks over to the security guard. I stand in the darkness and just yell for like a minute of like, fucking push him, fucking go, push him, fuck that guy. He doesn't, I do. And so I actually made it back to Chris's condo. And then I just stayed at his place by myself that night. Russ got spooked and never went, picked us up. He just fucking left us. Nah, yep. This motherfucker. Getaway left. driver. Getaway bailed. driver, gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
But there was like incidents like that. So Chris got in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Didn't but he rat didn't me rat? out. No. Nobody ever ratted me out. It's but I had like little things right like there. that. Yeah. We had we had a ton of just the dumbest. How how do we not get caught? The craziest one that I should have gotten caught for. We had another really dumb plan where we were going to steal bicycles at another apartment complex across the street from Chris's condo. And middle of the day. Uh, <laughs> and I had, I was, I was such a dork. I was into rollerblades. So I had rollerblades. It was Chris and one of Chris's friends. I can't remember his name. This other dude. We were going to get those guys bikes. And then they're going to bike downtown to this uh, like computer game store. I'm going to rollerblade. We're going to st uh, steal shit from there. God, it was the fucking dumbest plan. What was, I think, yeah, we we're going to steal shit from there. And then take, just ride our bikes back and stuff like that. Return them to whoever we stole them from. And then just go play these games. We didn't make it very, we never made it very far. We were very unsuccessful in all of these plans we had. <laughs> we go middle of the day. It's like these uh, big apartment buildings where there's maybe eight units on a side. And so there'll be like, you walk into, and then two little, I guess, entrances where you walk into an entrance and there's an apartment on your left. It's like two story apartment on your right, or you can go up the stairs, one on your left, one on your right. And then, but all of those have balconies and like screen doors and stuff. So if anybody's in there, they can just be looking out to see who's coming in this main entrance. Middle of the day, don't even check to see who's there. There's like two bikes next to one of the doors. Chris, and this other guy just walk in, just grab straight up, fucking grab these bikes, start walking them out. And then the guys were home. Like they just saw them walking away with their bikes. I'm like being my little fucking rollerblader in the parking lot out in front, <laughs> doing little circles, <laughs> waiting for them. And then these two guys come out and they're jacked. They're like oh, dudes in their yeah. 20s and they're like, what the fuck? Yeah, that's our fucking bikes. And now Chris and this other guy like throw the bikes down. They start running. Well, I'm on rollerblades and I'm rollerblading with one of the other guys who's running now during this, down this next like- Next to him? You're next to him. So I'm in front at first. Like I'm doing great. I'm <laughs> leaving him in the dust. <laughs> I'm fucking rollerblading way in front of him. But <laughs> I ain't never heard anybody <laughs> tell a story about getting away on rollerblades. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is, I wish I had visual of this just for my own memories, <laughs> like, a, like a video. In my mind, you're in short shorts and a half shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's probably not far off. So I'm fucking, I'm rollerblading. Oh, and at the edge, you know, in the desert, there would be these big, like, I guess what, where the water could drain off into the desert out of mm -hmm. the parking lot. So you, these big concrete things where you rollerblade. And then I made it to the end. So it's like a wall, like a six foot you know, concrete kind of block wall and we get cornered. Like there's nowhere to go. Me and this other dude on foot. Well, he's on foot. I'm on rollerblades. This other guy chases. He's on foot. We climb over the wall, throw ourselves. Well, now it's one of those you desert blocks. Rollerblades. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. did that. They're yeah. heavy, dude. They're oh, yeah. Light. I pulled yeah. myself over. Well, then check this shit out. I drop myself on their side. I have a full block of desert now. Now it's just oh, sagebrush. No. And I'm in fucking rollerblades. <laughs> nah. So I'm like, pick, you're all rolling in your roller oh, yeah. blades. So I'm running <laughs> as fast as I fucking can <laughs> on his roller blades. Oh, and, that, and now the dude who I was way ahead of, well, he fucking passes me because <laughs> yeah. he's on foot. And so, and then the other dude that's chasing us jumps over the wall. And now I have like this crazy adrenaline where I just have to make it to the sidewalk. And if I can make it to the sidewalk, I'll fucking um, beat him. Oh my God. I wish I had video of how fucking hard I was running in these heavy roller blades. <laughs> And then how the, <laughs> I did make it. <laughs> and I was so happy as I'm fucking rollerblading down the sidewalk. Like I barely made it to the sidewalk in front of him. Oh, but then I was gone. Like I was pretty, it's like so many close calls. You got like that. away on rollerblades, oh, yeah. dude. What but can you imagine, like there was a story. busy street next yeah. to us. I just picture somebody my age now yeah. driving and seeing this skinny and ass kid on rollerblades. <laughs> 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 Dude, chasing him. <laughs> if I could just get him before he hits that pain. Oh, he would have beat the fuck out of he me. He would have beat the shit out of me. <laughs> so, and so many incidents like that oh, of stomach. almost getting <laughs> annihilated. Oh, God. And All rightfully right. so by people I had done shitty things oh, to. Oh, fuck. God damn. That was hilarious. <laughs> According to the CDC, fewer men than women meet the minimum daily intake recommendations for fruits and vegetables, and men are more likely to overvalue exercise and undervalue nutrition. Enter Ritual, a multivitamin scientifically developed for men to help fill nutrient gaps in their diets. 
I've been, listen, I've been using Ritual for years. All right. They get mailed to my home. Uh, they come in little capsules, got those little balls in there too. It's hard to eat well all the time when you're running around on tour, doing podcasts, all that stuff. Ritual, I've been taking it for years. I, I threw away all the other multivitamins I used to go get at the store. And I've been using Ritual for years. I 100% believe in them. It's a science-backed multivitamin for men 18 and over with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. 10 key nutrients in two delayed release capsules per day designed to dissolve later in the small intestine, an optimal place to absorb nutrients. And it's gentle on an empty stomach with the minty essence in every bottle that helps make taste your multivitamins actually enjoyable. Essential for Men is a quality multivitamin from a company you can actually trust. Get 40% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash honeydew. This offer is only available through January 31st. Start your ritual or add Essential for Men to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash honeydew for 40% off. The Farmer's Dog was founded by two dog lovers who decided to reimagine pet food from the ground up. The results of switching your dog from kibble to fresh food can seem like magic when a senior dog starts acting like a puppy again or the pickiest of eaters can't wait for dinner time. You might think some spells were cast, but the Farmer's Dog doesn't use any sorcery or secret ingredients to make their fresh food, just science. It is developed by vets, nutritionally balanced, and made from real healthy ingredients to human food safety standards. It's the best best option for dogs at all life stages because it's not kibble, it's not canned goo, it's just real healthy food. Not only that, it's also pre-portioned specifically for your dog based on their unique nutritional needs. This makes it easy to help your dog maintain their ideal weight, which is one of the biggest indicators of a healthy life. It doesn't matter if your dog is young or old, it's always the right time to begin investing in their health, helping you live more healthy, happy and full years together. Get 50% off your first box of fresh, healthy food at thefarmersdog.com slash honeydew. <laughs> Plus, you get free shipping. Just go to thefarmersdog.com slash honeydew to get 50% off. That's thefarmersdog.com slash honeydew. The Honeydew is sponsored by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, every year, we're getting obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of taking time to just expand on what we're already doing right. Maybe you finally organized a part of your space and maybe you want to tackle another, or maybe you're taking your supplements every morning and now you want to add more to your routine too. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick, all right? I'm a I'm a big believer in therapy. I go to therapy. I still I just recently had a session just to talk, you know? Sometimes you just need somebody to listen and help you out. And I'm telling you, if you're at that point or even thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Honeydew today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Honeydew. Now! Let's get back to the do. Okay, so if you say you're graduating classes, yeah. so then you go back? Why do you go back? It was the weirdest, I guess, because my dad had Did you like there. it there? Did you like Vegas? living with your dad? I mean, more, than, that's my question. Did you enjoy living with It was with not what I thought it was going to be. I, I love, my, my dad and I have a good relationship now, mm-hmm. uh, but we had definitely some like rougher years and part of it was like, no, it was not, my my stepmom was a psychopath. Oh, he remarried as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and check this, this is the craziest, as a parent now, and again, I love my dad now, like we're good, so I don't want to throw my dad on the bus, but I just can't believe he did this looking back. So he's a divorced guy. Before I moved to Vegas, two kids. <laughs> he meets this blackjack dealer at one of the casinos downtown Vegas. They uh, they get married two weeks after they meet. Two Damn. weeks, and be- and in that interim, pro- during that two weeks, she tells him not only does she not want to have kids, I don't like kids. And so did she know he had two yes. before they got married. And these fucking idiots. So he marries a woman. As a guy with two kids who does not like kids, just straight up. And she marries him. Both of them fucking idiots. Marries a guy who she knows has two kids. And so she was not overjoyed when I went to live with them. 
And it was just, oh, so it was, it was not a great, like, you know, living with somebody who actively does not like you. <laughs> but you're a high schooler. Is yeah. that considered kid still for her just in general period? Not, not some toddler she had to help take care of or she know, doesn't she really was, even need to be a just, mom. No, and you she know, didn't you do got much. a mom. No. And yeah. she was kind of like, you know, absent. She just wasn't a good person. Like they yeah. ended up getting divorced later, but she just like, there was, I don't know what the fuck. The sex must've been amazing. Must've. Must've been amazing because I don't know other than that, like what he saw in her. <laughs> like no, nobody does. Were they together for a while? Uh, they were together for about 10, 15 years. So That's, quite a while. I gotta say off of a two year. Oh my God. Two weeks. I mean, it made two weeks. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank yeah. you. Two weeks to 15 years. Even, <laughs> even it unhealthy. Is it wasn't fucking, a good 15 years, yeah, but they, I'm saying. they fucking, yeah. they, <laughs> they kept it together. Shit, somehow. Oh, <laughs> paid for it big time. Uh, but, but then randomly. So, okay. So we're down there for two years. Well, He's, you know, not making a ton in construction and in Vegas at that time, he just um, feels like they're never going to be able to kind of get ahead down there. And he did like, in Riggins, he moved all around. He's like a pastor's son. His dad took various gigs at different Pentecostal churches. And so they moved around a bit, but they li he liked Riggins where he met my mom, still had friends there, liked that area of the country, just thought it was beautiful. He's a big hunter, outdoors guy. And randomly was just kind of looking back at the area. And so... 12, 13 miles outside of Riggins is a little community called Pinehurst. And I mean, I don't know, 15, 20 people live there. That's it? It's like a gas station. It's uh, like two families. Yeah, a gas station, a church, and then just a couple families. Like, oh, uh, shit. So it's not a town. It's just like there's these little communities along the yeah. river. He finds a piece of property there that is super cheap. And just uh, end of my sophomore year, is like, hey, we're going back to that area. And it was I, like if he would have moved 10 miles further away from Riggins, I would have been at a different school system. I would have been like with new meadows. So I ended up just happening to, to go back to my Same. original school. Yeah. So you, now you're reuniting with people so, you already yeah. knew. That's and that was super fun. So then junior, senior year, it's like, yeah, I didn't want to stay in Riggins forever, but it was just nice to have like my old friends and stuff. Yeah. Again. So that was good. Uh, but then it was just a weird living situation because I didn't get my driver's license before we left. I missed driver's training in Idaho. So I had a full year when we got back where I'm just kind of stuck out in Pinehurst. And uh, it's funny. I showed my mother-in-law. She was curious about where I grew up. We drove to like the the area where I was a little kid in Riggins and then took her out to Pinehurst. She literally cried at like how sad it was. She literally, <laughs> now literally, too, yeah, right? Yeah. Now. And it was yeah. worse then. Right. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> She's crying yeah. today. She's like, I can't believe you got out of here. Because yeah. it's like rural poverty. <laughs> My fucking room, my junior and senior year of high school was essentially a shed. Like I basically lived in a shed because there was like the main house, which was a one bedroom, one bath. One bed, one bath for your mom, dad. That was for stepmom and, and dad. sister. Yep. And then sister still at mom's most of the time. Okay. Well, there was this. Oh, wait, this is when you went back. This is when I go back. Okay. So now there's this outer building on the other side of the property that was no real insulation. I mean, it was built like a shed. It was like concrete floor. And no real insulation in the walls, uh, no uh, sink. I mean, we had a toilet out there, but that was it. It was just like a it was like a fucking room where you would you would feel like you uh, take a hostage, like uh, like some fucking sex dungeon where you're gonna trap somebody and like, hey, you can shit in the toilet. But that's all you got. <laughs> yeah. You gotta stay in this locked room. That was the bathroom, and then there was just uh, kind of two rooms. There was a wall in between, but it had a doorway, but no door. You never put a door in. So there was just like a curtain separating my sister's room and my room. No like AC, heat, none of that. And that that's where I lived fresh or junior or senior year. Damn. And and just out in the middle of fucking nowhere. Like So yeah. then when do you get out? When do you decide to move out of there? Uh after I graduated senior, I luckily No, I had to uh I worked for my dad in construction that summer to save money. But um just because I needed money for for college. And I worked at the grocery store. As soon as I got a, I turned 17, I was able to get a license. I got a little truck. Then I worked at the grocery store in town to save money. And then uh, and then I got a scholarship or a series of little scholarships and grants to Gonzaga. And, Did you? Mm -hmm, and, right. th and that's what got me out of there. Okay. Yeah. So I was, co college for me was less about like, oh, I got this plan of I'm going to do this and then I'm going to get this kind of job. It was just, I just fucking need to get out of here. And college was the the way to do it. And my family was very supportive of that too. They they wanted me to go to college. So what is your relationship like with your sister? Good. Yeah, really good. So was it did you and 
Did you two like enjoy getting back together when you moved back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. I mean, she's five and a half years right. younger. So at that age, it's a pretty big gap, you know? But um, but no, it was really good. Like I like try to look out for her and, you know, kind of mentor her a little bit, I guess, when I got to college. And and then as adults, we become like really close. You mentioned your mom remarried too. Was he a good dude? Yeah, he's a good dude. Like yeah, was yeah. good to you and mm -hmm. stuff, unlike the stepmom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's great. And and Tim is uh still are by the Are they step still dad. together? Mm -hmm. Oh, they are. Yep, he's a solid dude. Okay. Yeah. Super chill. Yeah, big uh big big gun guy. I like I like guns, you know, uh a fair like whatever. It's fun to shoot them. Listen, if he's you live really out there, you better be a fucking gun person. You don't just have people, you got animals, you got all kinds of shit oh, yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah, we did a little hunting and stuff. Yeah. My dad's really big into that. But my stepdad, he was a like a logging equipment mechanic. And yeah, just a cool dude. It's a job you don't hear often. I know. Right? Yeah. What'd yeah. your mom do? She worked at uh, when we first moved back. She worked at like the pizza place and a variety of little places. And then she got a job at the grocery store kind of doing their bookkeeping. And then she went from there to like, there was like one bank in town. So it was a pretty like coveted job because it had benefits, uh, you know, decent pay. And then, so she worked as a, a checker at the, at the bank or teller, I guess. Yeah. And then my, my grandma and my, and my grandparents, my mom's parents, my grandma, Betty and grandpa, they were like the real glue that were like provided the most stability. So no matter where I was, I always had a super good relationship they lived with them. Local as well. Mm -hmm. They lived in Riggins. We lived with them. When we first moved back from Alaska. My grandpa had built a series of little rental houses. And so actually the places we lived with my mom were places he owned. Okay. And super helpful to his two daughters. And they both were. And uh, but like he worked at the sawmill before it <laughs> before it burnt to the ground and wasn't rebuilt. And my grandma worked at the post office. So they had like good jobs for that little town. Yeah, post office. Yeah. That's a government job oh, yeah. in that town. Hell mm -hmm. yeah. So she worked at the post office for like 30 some years. So you had a little bit of family, but you have no cousins or anything like that that you know of up there, just you and your sister. Yeah, cousins in other little towns mm -hmm. an hour, hour and a half away, but no nobody else in town. Yeah. Were you an introvert or were you just forced to be an introvert at first and then you realize you're not when you get to Vegas? Like, what were you like growing up? I, no, are you spending a lot of alone time? Yeah, but I'm, I think I've always, I've always been an introvert, you know, where it's like, it's weird. Like, you know, I love conversations like this, but as far as like, you want me to come hang out at some big get together, like no part of that has ever sounded fun to me, really. Like when I was hammered I in college. I'm, I'm an extroverted introvert. Yeah, yeah, I can turn it on for moments, I can but be I need in to front recharge. of crowds and every, yeah, yep. no, I don't want to go fucking hang out at the yep. anniversary party or right. whatever. I'm not interested. Yeah, me too, good, me yeah. too. And so I, I did, I think it helped, honestly, my imagination. I just like, you know, read a lot of books, uh, played a lot of like stuff, you know, just, games by myself. Like when I was little, it was GI Joe's and that where you're building scenarios and all this stuff. And then in high school, when I came back, you know, got into like Dungeons and Dragons for a little bit, but just a um, lot of time to think and a lot of time just to, I don't know, daydream and stuff, I guess. So I did, I do think that shaped me somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk. Um, I just want to switch gears for a second because we were talking before we recorded about, you know, you start to get a little bit of success and then yeah. you got to keep working, right? We right. all have that, like, I don't know. I just come from that. It's fun. I just saw this clip the other day that was like, yeah, it's like um, I worked five jobs at one point. Wow. You know, yeah. I, I never worked less than three, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. doing something. And I was always broke. Right. And then you hear all these other people, I'm working three jobs, they're always broke. And I was yeah. like, there's got to be a smarter, not harder way. Right. And when you just come from that, you know, I, I'm blue, very blue collar background and come from mm -hmm. that, just work. And you don't even know why. It's go to college and you'll make something yourself. Like, yeah. Wait, oh, yeah. Totally. I'm just supposed to go to this university yep. and then magically I'm going to make something that myself. Was, like yep. it was that's what everyone the, the answer to success was mm -hmm. college. Yep. And I no longer feel that way at all. <laughs> um, I, I'll go back and forth with my daughter's mother on this because she's like, are you going to save for a college fund? And I'm like, no. Nah. <laughs> No. She's like, well, what if she wants to go to college? I was like, I'll deal with it once she wants to go to college. Like, yeah, I yeah. had nothing. Yeah. So just because we have, I don't want to just throw money. And well, then you could just give her the fucking $40,000 where I'm like, yeah, I'm good on that. I'm right, good on that. Right. I'm going to use that motherfucking money. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you actually hit a little bit of burnout. Is oh, that right? 
Yeah, for the first time, because like you, I was raised, you know, very, you know, poor and, and like blue collar and same thing, like in high school, you know, as soon as I could drive, I'm, I'm working before I go to school doing I like started freight. seventh grade, started okay. working in seventh grade. Like when I was in, when I was in grade school and stuff, I mowed a bunch of lawns. That was like mm -hmm. how I get some extra money. And then, uh. You, you ever shovel high snow for people? You got to. We didn't have enough snow there. Randy. Really? Yeah, it's like it's in a weird little oh. microclimate. If you go uh, half an hour in any either direction, I've been to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and it's just lots fucking, of snow. Yeah, but where we, yeah, not much there, but yeah, little you know, do this, okay. do that, work for my dad, go to job sites, you know, construction, then work, you know, the the before school, after school, when I got to college, always had a job, and like you said, usually two, never had more than three, but I would have like multiple jobs. You know, got out of uh, school, had my full time job. It's kind of like a low level counselor type uh, position, but then also worked at a gym, always working lots of hours and then just carried that mentality into comedy, mm -hmm. you know, doing stand up, but then trying to like, uh, you know, sell spec scripts or uh, working in reality television as a consultant producer while doing stand up, mm -hmm. while hosting this other thing, just always doing a lot of things. Stand up, always present, yep. doing 10 yep. other fucking things. Yep, yes. and then carried that into podcasting, launching all these podcasts, but then, but yeah, but I also do stand up. So, you know, when you're offered like tour dates, especially once you start to kind of sell some tickets, you're like, oh man, now I'm, after 15 years, I'm finally making more than 1500 a week, you know, doing this and then saying yes to all that. And just in the habit of just always saying yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, there's an opportunity, I'll take it. And then pretty soon I'm working legitimately 70 plus hours a week, every week. And then that just becomes normal of like never having a day off, uh, even on vacation, wife, kids, they'll go do something. I work half days and then I'm hanging out with the fam in the evenings. And that just like became our like normal way of life. And then it was just this last year that I just started to get like so tired and just... Yeah, just really, but I, but I didn't even interpret it as that at first. I just felt like depressed and I'm like, why am I not enjoying all these things that I've been when, enjoying? When did you, when did it like finally click? Like, oh, man, I've just been, cause, cause for a while you just get yeah. in that work mode, work, totally. work, work. When did it hit you where you were like, Hey, it was when my son went to college. It was like, I think I had this end goal, like, cause then I got divorced, you know, later and really struggled for a few years after the divorce, like worrying about, am I going to be able to help my kids go to college? My ex-wife, she's killing it in the corporate world. Great job. Am I going to be like the deadbeat dad and not be able to help? All these things are coming up in my head, like worried about like, am I going to be a, a version of kind of how my dad was for a certain period and not be able to help? And that was like a big fear of mine. So then once I started making some money, I'm like, oh, cool. I'll be able to like help my kids like I wanted to. And then that became my whole focal point was getting the kids to college. And my wife and I moved back to Coeur d'Alene to be close to my ex. Like we didn't move there because we wanted oh, to live back okay, in Idaho. Okay, so you were married once. Right. And got divorced. Got divorced. You had two kids? Two kids. Okay. Yep, my son and my daughter moved to LA, flying them back and forth, trying to make something here. Wow. You know, a lot. so it's tough. So, yeah. so it's like, you know, when you're, when you're not working, you're also getting on planes to make sure you're present father, all mm -hmm. these things. Well, if you want to be a good father. Totally. Which, right, you know, you very be, much. You could have totally been a deadbeat. Could have been a piece of shit. Yeah, could. But wanted to be a good dad. And uh, and then we moved to Coeur d'Alene thinking that was going to fuck our careers. It definitely fucked my wife's career. She worked in a film and TV production, mm. said goodbye to that. So then all our focus became just on the kids up in Coeur d'Alene and making sure that work, making sure the sacrifice we took so wait, ways. you actually did the opposite of your father. You married a woman that liked kids. Yep, good for oh, you. Oh, that was yeah. <laughs> good after, for you. after that, way to not oh, replay that out. Oh my god! <laughs> when she first met him, I remember being so nervous because I was super into her. Can I ask you how long you waited before you introduced your new wife to your children? It wasn't super long because when we started dating, the kids were with me for the summer, and they were about to go back, and so I, I wanted just to test the waters. Mm -hmm. So we all went to a Dodgers game. That's and that good. was like the introduction. We go to a Dodgers game with, you know, with my friend. And I was just curious how the kids would take to her. And I was super nervous because if it didn't click, I was like, well, then that, that's it. It's over. But I, but I was like really into her. And thank God, like they adore her. Like she's a super And vice mom. versa. Yep. And vice versa. Hell yeah, good. She's very, very uh, nurturing. She worked at like, like a, what, I guess the synagogue daycare and stuff. So she was like worked with kids. And liked that and was a nanny for a couple families uh, early on when she was getting into production. So I knew that she was good with kids, but you don't know that's going to translate to yours. So luckily that works. 
but then like, so Lindsay and I, so my wife and I's focal point becomes we're living here for the kids. We're busting our ass for the kids and everything is like getting them to college. And then when my son, when I dropped him off in college and come home, it was like the most unexpected depression yeah. just hit like so hard. Like, you know, miss him a ton. I was going to say, is you're an empty yeah. nester. Yeah well, yeah. well, you have one kid partial halfway. And then, but it was also like, I didn't realize that I crossed this finish line where I'm like, well, I was just focused on just getting them to college. Now one's there and we're doing okay financially. It's like this thing. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm not poor anymore. And then it was like, and I go right back into the grind of the 70 hours a week. But then I had this lingering feeling of like, why are you still doing this? Like, why are you still working this many hours? And this awareness of you only have three years left with Monroe and then she's going to be in college. Like, you know how that hits now. Don't you want to like be around even more because now you can. And then that, that voice is just kind of in the background. And then I have this special come out on YouTube and we're doing these press for it. So I'm doing the podcasting, uh, the tour dates, flying to New York, flying to LA, taking these trips. And when I was in New York, like a month or two ago, Lindsay was, my wife was trying to get me to uh, come up with a tour name. And she's talking about, hey, we got to make plans. We got to get these things uh, together as far as when you're going to announce certain things on the podcast. And I've been dragging my feet on that stuff. And she just said, she's like, honestly, she goes, I don't think you want to do it. And I was like, what? And she's like, every time I bring it up, you want to push things off and you don't seem excited. Do you want to do this? And, and I just like thought for a second, I'm like, I don't know. And, she, and then she said, if I, you know, she's like, you don't need my permission, but she's like, you don't have to. And just so you know, I'm not going to be upset. I'm not going to care that we're going to lose that money. She's like, I care about you. I want to make sure that you're healthy. She's like, I'm worried about you. And, and there've been months of people being like, Hey, I'm worried about how much you're working. Yeah. They and, were saying, mm -hmm. and in the family, like my dad and stuff, years of people being like, you're working too much. And like you, it's like, I always pride myself on that blue collar work ethic. And that was like how you have kind of worth and value is you're a hard worker. That's like the best thing you can be in life is a hard worker, a hustler, a hustler, yeah. a grinder. So much respect for that. And now I'm having more people being like, yeah, but you don't have to grind this hard. And then when Lindsay was like, you don't need to do this. And I'm like, you, you promise you're not going to be mad. And she's like, no. And I'm like, I don't think I want to do it. And then that led to this domino effect where I fired my agency uh, cancel this tour, uh, also cancel some of the bonus content we were doing on Patreon for time suck because it was, it was just a lot. It was like a lot of weekly things, explain that to the fans. And I'm kind of panicking internally. Like I know I need to do this, but in my brain, I think all the fans are going to go away. People are going to think I'm a fucking huge pussy. Uh, the concert promoter will never want to work with me again. Cause I'm a fucking baby. Like all these old school, tough guy voices being like, up, oh, you're a fucking pussy. And uh, now you're being exposed for that. And it's all going to go away. Nope. Everybody was cool. Everybody was like, good job, man. You got to take care of yourself. Uh, agent left the agency, like still with him. Cons promoters, like whenever you're ready to come back, we support you. We love you. Actually, Andrew Dorfman, one of the Dorfman brothers, he's like, he was worried uh, seeing me in Nashville uh, about my mental health a little bit too, I guess. It was, it was this weird thing where it's like, after I said like, no, it's, there was a lot of people coming out of the woodwork being like, I was pretty worried about you. <laughs> like as far, far as like kind of things I'm talking about on stage, you know, uh, maybe doing psychedelics and things a little too much, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> talking about drugs too much on stage. And then I kind of analyze that too. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's like, it's not that I was going to become some fucking addict, but the reason I was trying to do that stuff more is just to have an escape. Mm -hmm. Just to like, it's the only way I could shut my brain off from like being in work mode. So it, it was a, it was a weird week. I felt embarrassed, you know, telling people that I needed time off. I don't know. It was like emasculating but, almost. I, I can understand that. Yeah. But, yeah. That's that then it old feels good. fucking, you yeah. know, grind, whatever mentality, dude mentality, walk it off. Totally. You can't cry. No, nope. you're not hurt. Just fucking yep. walk, shut up and walk it off. Exactly. Yeah. Put your head down and yep. work. You just push so past it. When did, when you made that shift and finally accepted it, did you start to feel different? At first I felt really like embarrassed and weird. And, it, and it's funny, I'm a, I'm a huge mental health advocate mm -hmm. and talk about it all the time on the podcast. Dude, I just had to reschedule a weekend in Illinois because I had to go have another back procedure and I was so Man. worried. Yeah. I had never like... I've missed a weekend, but yeah. only because of flights canceled yep. and didn't make it. I've never, ever yeah. shut a whole weekend down and had to reschedule 
for um, health stuff. For, well, that's not true. Actually, I was headlining the Brea Improv and collapsed in the shower with kidney stones the first Damn. night I was ever going to headline. I had to oh. call them like I, I am not. Gonna, I had to call them yeah. from the hospital. Oh. And be like I am just FaceTiming you from the hospital to let you know. Right. Um, but this was the first time, and I was so worried everyone was going to be. Pit- they couldn't yeah. have been nicer. It, it, they couldn't have been nicer. Right. They get it. They get it. That was my experience yeah. too. And it's like I had this weird thing in my head where it's like I'm advocating for everybody else's mental health. But not taking care of ourselves. But not taking like and uh and that also felt weird too. Like I I started feeling more like a hypocrite where I'm like, oh, I want you to take care of yourself, but I'm tougher than that. I don't fucking need that. I'll I'll keep grinding. And then, but yeah, but then the fans like they were like, Yeah, man, like you're always telling us to do these things in our lives. How shitty would we be? if we didn't give you that same grace. And it was really touching actually. And just like everybody being cool. And then now that it's settled in and now that I have, like I'm not gonna be doing all these dates next year, I'm still gonna be working plenty mm-hmm. on the podcast, but then I'm just gonna be working like, what feels like a light 40 to 50 hours. Mm-hmm. I feel like this crazy weight was lifted. I feel so much happier and uh, and more creative. I feel like the most creative I've felt in because well, you know, have time to be creative now. Right. You're not just in this regimented schedule of we exactly. got to get on here, fly there, get on this yep. car, go to this place, go to that. You know, you have time to be creative. I, I, you ever do mantras in the morning, like wake up and repeat phrases to get your mind set? No, should I? I, I journal. I write okay. a lot. You know, I do that, but I don't wake up and. My, I, my mantra every morning is like, come on, Stella, get up. <laughs> Let's go. Come on. We yeah. got to get to school, girl. Uh, that's, yeah, my, yeah. that's my mantra every morning. I, I would do like, what do you call it? Like giving yourself intentions for the day. Yeah. And it did, it was effective, but also looking back, kind of sad where it's like, I would have these mantras. And one of them was like, I would literally tell myself I was a robot. Like you're, you're a machine, you're a robot. Like you can power through, you can outwork anybody, like all these crazy things. And I put myself in that mode and I would, and I would go into that mode, but then it was very regimented. I was able to accomplish a lot, but I had to have like basically no emotions. Mm-hmm. And, and then just no time for like reflection, creativity, just like, nope, I'm going to do this for two hours. Then I'm going to have a 15 minute lunch. Then I'm going to do this. I'm going to eat this kind of thing. Cause it's light. It's not going to make me sleepy uh, on this plane. I should be able to get two hours. I mean, so regimented. And after a while, I'm like, that's not a fucking good way to live. Like, what am I doing? Like I got into all this cause it's fun. Yes. And now I've become this uh, machine that is trying to create fun for others while not having fun myself. And I'm like, that is fucking crazy. I'm a big, uh, that's a big fuck up of mine too, is taking care of people, being a people pleaser, Yep, taking care of everybody else. And yep, I'll do that for you. Mm -hmm. I'll do that for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I don't take care of myself. Isn't it? Or they won't do what, you know what I'm saying? Like reciprocate. Yeah, the reciprocation. I'm like, "Mm, that's tough. There was some... Oh, like Warren Buffett. It's like that guy, I've been fascinated with him forever. And I would read like quotes of his for a while. And years ago, I read something about him saying, and other people have said this, but how no is the most powerful word you can use. And that he said like the most successful people he has ever kind of worked around and met are people who are really good at saying no. The people really good at like, nope, this is what I can handle. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm doing. Boundaries. Boundaries. Yeah. Get away from me with everything else. It's great advice. Segura taught me that a while oh, ago. Really? There's power and no. Because I was like, yeah. I called him up and I go, I want your advice on this. I don't even remember what yeah. the hell it was years ago. And I'm like, did it? And he goes, you know what? Say no. You, I can tell you want to say no. Yeah. And you're only saying yes because you think you, there won't be another opportunity fear, if I right? say no. Yeah. Fear yeah. of everything, you yep. know? Um, and just always in that like um, survival mode. Survival. Yes. I yes. got to say yes because God forbid – where am I going to get another $1,500 opportunity in the right. next month or whatever, right. you know? So, and then when he said that to me, there's power and no. And it wasn't just saying no to bad deals. It's right. also saying no to overextending yourself exactly. and, and doing all these things. It's it's a great advice for mental health. Yeah, I, I, it, I, it took me until I was 46 to really figure that I'm one out. I'm 50 and I still don't have it figured out, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you get habitual, habitualized, I think, in like, I don't know if you, well, I don't, I shouldn't assume you do this. But I do this, and I imagine you do this, where you kind of internally maybe think of yourself as Ryan from 10 years ago, 15 mm-hmm. years ago, 20 years ago, not Ryan today. Mm-hmm. Because like today, you're a very established figure in the comedy community. You have a very successful podcast, a uh, very successful stand-up. Like people starting off, I would love to be Ryan Sickler. Like you are a known figure. 
But you probably think of yourself as the guy. The 16 year old that has no parents and has no fucking income and yeah. no outlook on life and has no idea what the fuck he's going to do. And right. Panic, panic, panic. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. Isn't That's it a crazy thing, thing we do to that, ourselves? Yes. yes. Yeah. I have yet to like just take a deep breath and be like, all right. You know, so I try to practice that too. Like, yeah. hey, tomorrow. We're fine. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to focus on today. Today right. we're good, but also tomorrow we're going to be good too. Yeah. No yeah. matter what happens today, when we wake up tomorrow, that day is also going to be just fine. Yep. Yeah. Because we're sitting right now where, but I couldn't think that before. You yeah. know what that's like. I, oh, yeah. I'd, I'd lived in my car for a while. I could yeah. not say, yeah. hey, today's good and tomorrow is also going to be okay. Yeah. So for me, that's leaps and bounds improvement, you know? Totally. Yeah. And I'm saying this stuff now, but I still have those days too. Like right now oh, I feel yeah. good, but you know, uh, a week from now I could be, I mean, my wife, <laughs> it's like, she's such a saint that way. But Lindsay will also openly tell people like, oh yeah, he's crazy as shit. It's like, you're like, live with him. Like he's a fucking maniac, like just all over the place. And I'm working on it, but it's like, I'll have a day like this today. And then a week from now I, I might be like telling her, I'm like, it, it's all going away. We're going to fucking lose everything. <laughs> like, we, <laughs> like she, she doesn't even get rattled anymore when I say shit like that. She's like, <laughs> She's used okay, to it. all right. You, maybe you're hungry. Go through. Hungry, you're probably probably hungry. a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pull it together. Dude, thank you for doing this episode. This has been uh, you, very, man. very insightful. Um, your first time here on this podcast. So I ask everybody. Yeah. After whatever we've talked about, it's interesting because you had that high school shift to uh, advice you'd give to your 16 year old self. Oh man, uh, what I would tell my you my six year old self is wear sneakers like, and get off those motherfucking oh, rollerblades. Stop, stop trying to burn everything. Stop, <laughs> stop trying to blow trying. shit up. But I would I would tell I'm like things are gonna get a lot better. Like you're gonna be okay. Like you're a fucking angry dude right now. Like a, a very destructive guy. But I'm like, I know you can't see it, but there's gonna be a path for you, and you're gonna be fine. Like you're gonna be okay. So just ease up. That's great advice. And your stepmom's gonna die of cancer. When you're about 30 and it's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to be gone. She's going to be dead. And you're going to be okay. <laughs> Dude, this is a great episode. Uh, please, again, plug, promote, all of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so if you just... Um, Go to, you can find Time Suck. If you want, uh, you know, to, I try to make learning fun. You can learn about, you know, various cults, uh, historical figures, historical moments, or if you like uh, campfire ghost stories, I got a bunch of them with Scared to Death, or you can find a bunch of my stuff online, stand up wise, including uh, trying to get better on YouTube. Hell yeah. Thank you for doing Thank this. Thank you, for Ryan. Real. Yeah. As always, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. We'll talk to y'all next week. Mm -hmm.